Good morning, church. Are you glad you came to church? Wow, I am so excited to see you. If you can wave at someone and tell them clearly, you're looking good. <laughs> wow. Everything that exists was created twice. First, in the mind of the creator, and then in the physical realm. Think about anything you have. Whether it's your phone, the clothes you wear, the house you live in. It was first in the mind of the designer before it was manifested in the physical dimension. Of course, sometimes we try to go around consulting experts for good reasons. Because sometimes we don't want them to interfere with the design in our mind. Sometimes we want to save time and money. True story. There was a guy here in the U.S. who put up a restaurant. He was a professional chef. He had, some, he had worked as a professional chef for so many years and he had in mind how an ideal restaurant should look like. So he came up with one. He made it very nice. He had good food. The dining sets, the chairs, everything was superb. Unfortunately, he forgot to put the entrance door. So good food, good interiors, but the customers could not get in the restaurant. To redesign the restaurant almost cost him twice the original cost. And this is true for many of us. Many times we want to go through this life without seeking the designer's plan for our lives. We walk through it and Jesus said, how can the blind lead the blind? Many of us are like blind people leading other blind people. In every area of our lives, be it marriage, we ignore the manufacturer's manual. Be it in our careers, in our finances, in our health, in our parenting, often than not, we try to run our own lives, ignoring our maker, ignoring our designer. And this is what God says. Isaiah 46, 10. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is yet to come. And I say, my purpose will stand. I make known the end from the beginning. I declare the end from the beginning. No matter your puny efforts, I say, my purpose will stand. And what amazes me is the verse just before that decree. He begins in verse 9 by saying, Remember my works of long ago. I am God and there is none other. Check my CV. Check my resume. Look at how you crossed the Red Sea. Look at how I formed the planet, the order in the universe. Before time began, before there were men to worship me, before I made angels to worship me, I was, I am still God. And now I'm telling you, I declare the end from the beginning. I already know the end before I start. I never start anything before I know the end plan, the end game. And this is what I'm saying now. No matter what you try to do, my purpose will stand. Jesus understood the seriousness of his father's purposes. Throughout his other ministry, Jesus repeatedly said, I'm doing the will of my father. I'm doing the will of the one who sent me. Every single miracle followed the script. From his birth, his life, the last supper, the death, the resurrection, to his ascension on high, Jesus followed the script to the letter. No wonder he accomplished his purpose in three years. No other person on this planet has ever accomplished such a divine purpose, even in an entire lifetime. 
And God comes and tells you this morning. Proverbs 19.21. He's telling you this morning. Many are the plans in a man's heart. But God's purpose will prevail. Irrespective of your plans. God's purpose will prevail over your plans. Can I therefore submit to us this morning. Your first assignment is to figure out. To find out your purpose. And your second assignment is to pursue that purpose. To know your master plan. To know what the programmer had in mind. And ask him for the program. Ask him for the script. He says, call unto me. And I will show you great and mighty things than you think not. That you think not. That you don't even think about. So here is the deal. God already knows your end game before he made you. He made you for a particular purpose. And you can see it end to end. So he's saying, if I have started something, it's already as good as done. For example, God says he's the author of salvation. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. So we can count on God's character. He's saying, check my resume. Check my past. Everything I said comes to pass. I started this salvation plan. You don't have to worry. Relax. I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. Let's face it and be honest with each other. Many of us here, most of us anyway, around the, the world... Over 99.9% .9 of people. We still have some food on the table. The food may vary. But we still sleep under a roof. Somehow we make ads meet. But even though we make ads meet. By ignoring God's script for our lives. We walk through this life. Through a lot of struggles. Pushing rocks uphill. Simply because we operate outside the script. And I want to suggest, true victory comes by aligning with your master plan. The original script. When you know the script in our master, then you don't have to wait for things to unfold. Most people wait for what tomorrow will bring. When you know the script, then you create things. You begin to create things as per the script. You are created a creator. Creation was not done in six days. Creation did not stop on the sixth day. Because God on the sixth day created other creators. Created you to continue with his creation. Created us as creative, imaginative beings to invent stuff. And today I want us to think clearly as victors. And victory begins by understanding the plan. When you don't know the plan, the design becomes faulty at the foundation stage. The foundation of whatever project you're doing is already faulty. And I'm so excited with this series we are doing on mindsets. And today I want us to compare and contrast victors and victims. So mindset number, do you know where we are? 15, yeah. <laughs> oh, with the blue girls in the house, we can't confuse the numbers. Mindset number 15. Victim mindset. Victim mindset. I, I, are you excited with this series? Wow, we thank God. Now, there are people who are always bypassed by promotion. There are people who are always losing job. And I say this with humility to some of you watching me on social media. And you're impacted by COVID-19. But the truth is, in the same company, there are people who are never impacted negatively by COVID-19 or another situation. There are people for some reason, they are victims of job loss, victims of every single accident in life. I have people who have written to me. Others have called me crying. Why is it only our family? Early deaths, early accidents. Every single victim thing happens. There are people who are abused everywhere they go. Everything they touch, everywhere they go, things just collude against them. And I want to talk to you and I want to encourage you 
if you sense you've gone through this. How do you know you have a victim mindset? It's one thing to go through stuff. It's the other thing to have that mindset. Going through stuff does not mean you have a victim mindset. You know you have a victim mindset if any of these six things affect you. I'll mention them. One, blame games. You keep blaming others for your predicament. You blame the past. You blame your parents. You blame your husband, your wife, your ex, your children, your employer. You blame everyone. Everyone is wrong except you. You happen to be the only right one. You have a victim mindset. Number two, people with victim mindset are always wishing things were better. Wishes. I wish the world was safer, was more peaceful. I wish I came from a better background. I wish I was more educated. I wish I had that college degree. I wish I had such and such a husband. Wishes. Number three, they take offense very easily. They feel like everyone is working their downfall, colluding against them. Number four, they act helpless more than they would care to admit. So they tolerate abuse. They allow people to step all over them. And they feel they deserve it. They deserve to be physically, emotionally, and verbally abused. So they soak in abuse. Number five, they expect others to fix their problems. They somehow think others should help them. And number six, they build their identity around their problems. They are attention seekers. In fact, some of them don't like their problems fixed. Being broken gives them the attention they are looking for. They become drama queens. Self-pitying men who solicit for sympathy. Hear me, gentlemen. If you're watching me on Facebook or YouTube, don't ever solicit for sympathy. If you have lost your job, it's your responsibility to affirm your wife and your children, to inspire them that it will take just a few more weeks before you get another job. Just a few more weeks before you start on your feet. Stop acting helpless. You see, this life has victors and victims. We all go through situations in life. While God determines the path we go through, we determine how we go through this path. We determine whether we will go through our individual paths as victims or as victors. The choice is in our hands. Paul writes the church in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 4, 8-9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not in despair. Perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. At a time he was going through a serious conflict. We are hard pressed on every side. On the side of finances, emotions, physically. I have been left for the dead three times. I have even fought with the beasts. Shipwrecked three times. I'm hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Uh -uh. No, uh -uh. I'm not crushed. Even though I'm perplexed, I am not in despair. Even though I'm persecuted, I am not abandoned. I know the Lord is with me. I can ride on his promises that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Even though I'm struck down, I am not destroyed. Let's face it, sometimes we create our own mess. We create the mess in our own lives. I have personally seen people who play victim to the circumstances they themselves create. They create their own storms and then they get mad when it rains. I ask today, who do you think will sort out your mess? Who do you think lacks sleep because you're broken? And that's why I emphasize this morning, never solicit for pity. Start up and deal. You can't act a victim and heal. One mistake, with all due respect, a couple of Pentecostal Christian churches are making, 
is to always pray for people's problems and make them believe God can solve all these problems and never tell people the truth of what they need to deal. I want you to know the truth, church, because only the truth that you know will set you free. Most of the things we pray in church are nonsensical. God will not sort them out. He created you as a thinking being with the power to choose, free will to choose. You have decisions you have to make and implement for your life to be better. When God says, for example, as long as the earth endures, Genesis 8.22, there will be sowing time and reaping time. It doesn't matter how you pray. That law stands. There will be sowing time and reaping time. If you do not sow, you will not reap. You can pray, you can fast, you can do all the drama in the church, but you will simply not harvest. It's that simple. God does not answer prayers that contradict his word. All prayers God answers are in line with his word. The Bible says he answers all prayers in accordance to his will. This is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything in accordance to his will, he heareth us. Sorry, I said it in the old King James. So there are prayers people have prayed for. And they flock in such churches. Because you're always encouraged that you're going to win without doing your part. There is God's part, there is your part. That's why we will continue teaching the truth here. Those who can handle the truth will walk with us. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And guess what he does? The enemy focuses on weak points. On the wounded. That's the one he targets to destroy. Just like in the jungle. It is the weak animal that is targeted by carnivores. It is the wounded, the limping animal that is killed. In nature, the weak animals get eliminated. Nature rejects weakness. Never, ever play weak. You play weak at your own peril. I'm not sure whether we are communicating. But I encourage you, stand up and deal. Don't solicit for sympathy. Solicit for synergies and partnerships on how to solve your issues. That way, you cross over from victim mindset to number 16. Victor mindset. Victor mindset. I read of a story of a school bully who had a list of the boys he's going to beat. One little tiny boy went over to the bully and said, and here you have a list of the names of the boys you're going to beat. The bully said, yes, that's true. Then the little tiny boy said, but you can't beat me. And the bully said, all right, I'll remove your name from the list. And that was the end of the story. A tiny thing with a victor mindset. <laughs> I'll take your name off the list. That easy. You see, it's not the size of the man, but the size of his heart that matters. Allow me to tell you four things about people with a victor mindset. One. They expect victory. They expect to win. They expect favor. They expect honor. They expect to be rich. They expect to be healthy. Even when they are sick, they expect to recover. They expect to always have a job if they want to build a career along that area. If they're in business, they expect to succeed. They expect customers to flow. They expect expect to have stable marriages. They expect their children to be successful. They have good expectations. They have victory expectations, victorious expectations. Number two, people with a victim mindset, they don't blame anyone. They don't complain. They take responsibility for their situation, for where they are, for their income, for their relationships. They take total responsibility. L let me tell you something, guys. Please. You know, when a preacher stops, he's about to say something profound. <laughs> the opposite of responsibility is not irresponsibility. 
The opposite of responsibility is liability. Whenever you don't take responsibility, you pay for it. There is a price to it. There is a liability to be paid. So take responsibility. Number three, people with a victim mindset, they don't wait for things to happen. They are shakers and movers. They cause things to happen. And number four, they don't quit. People with a victim mindset understand victory does not come easy. It may be a long, hard, tedious fight, but they stay the course. People with a victory mindset don't quit. Years ago, I read the story of a bulldog that was in a gated compound. And the neighboring compound had two mighty bulldogs, bigger than the other one. So this one dog, I will call it a little bulldog. It was huge, yes, but it was smaller than the other two. So this other compound had two huge, mighty bulldogs, the size of a calf. One day, the little bulldog crawled to this other compound. It was so beaten, it was 10 in the morning. It was thoroughly beaten, went back in shame. The second day, same time, 10 in the morning, it crawled back to the compound with the mighty bulldogs. It was humiliated. This time round, the tail was almost torn. The sides were bleeding, went back home in serious pain. Day number three, exactly at 10 in the morning, it crawled back again to the compound with the two mighty bulldogs. This time round, the nose was almost torn. The woods were severe. The pains were excruciating. It was almost unbearable. Went back home to nurse the woods in open sun. Day number four, once more, went back to the compound with the two mighty bulldogs. And the battle was severe. Beaten once again. Day number five, back. Day number six. Day number seven, day number ten. When the two mighty bulldogs had the little bulldog coming, they ran for their lives. They were tired with the fight. And the little bulldogs roamed around that compound, making a statement. You quit. I rule. I reign. I won the fight. President Dwight Eisenhower once said, it is not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. Winners never quit. The longer the fight, the sweeter the victory. Romans 8 37, scripture says, We are more than conquerors. Let me give you the definition of more than conquerors through a story. I had a story of a professional boxer who went into the ring. This particular ring was going for 12 rounds, no matter in boxing. They do 9 to 12 rounds, 3 minutes per round. Within the third round, he was so broken. He had already lost some two teeth. He was bleeding all over, red face. By the time they were doing the 12th round, he barely made it to the 12th round. But this other guy gave up by the 12th round. And eventually, this dude won marginally, tangentially, you know, just by a whisker. But he won. He was declared the winner. And he was given a $1 million check. He is a conqueror. He went home and handed over the check to the wife. She's more than a conqueror. Here is the definition. Our elder brother Jesus fought the battle for us. He won the victory and handed over the victory. We don't need to go through the same thing. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. I had over to you. I had over the keys to you. I am the conqueror. You are more than conquerors. The Bible says in Colossians 2.15, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, 
he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He made a public spectacle of the enemy, sort of a ring, bruised the enemy, and now handed over the victory to us. He came back and said, I have been bruised, but guess what? By the stripes I have received, you in turn receive your healing with no stripes. Through my poverty, you become the riches of God without being poor. Through the sorrow, the groanings I went through, you receive the peace of God. Jesus on the night he was arrested. He had groanings that words cannot express. He had grief unto death. He told the three disciples, Peter, John, and James, I am distressed to the point of death. I have been pushed emotionally. I feel like dying so that you and me may walk without depression. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. He comes back and says, I had you over the victory. I am the conqueror. You are more than conquerors. You didn't have to fight this battle. I have made a public spectacle of the enemy. You are victors through him who won the battle for us. The greater the fight, the more glorious the victory. The greater the fight, the greater the triumph. It's easy to admire victors until you hear their story, until you get to know their journey. It's not whether you get knocked down. This life will hit you hard. It is whether you get up. You see, the 57-year-old professional athlete, Michael Jordan, matters basketball. Let's be honest. He's a man among boys. And once he was interviewed about the secret of his success, let's borrow a leaf from his response. And I quote, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. 26 times I have been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over again in my life. And that's why I succeed. End of quote. Many of you know today, as at May 2020, he was rated by Forbes, the most reliable source, at 2.1 billion US. And you know he has signed a partnership with Nike. Money is not everything. But let's be honest with each other. Most problems people face through is about money. In one of these Sundays, I'll just have a whole series on money. January, when I was just here praying, I had the Lord telling me to teach you in January back to the basics. And I'm requesting you, please think of one major change you're going to make in your life in 2021 to open a totally new chapter in your life. Think of one fundamental change, not a tangential change, not a marginal change. I'm talking of a quantum change, a big change that you're likely to make in your life. We'll be making some in this church. I encourage you, don't miss church the first Sunday of January. And I want you to think about it because I want to carry you along as we make critical changes in our lives. I don't know whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your finances, whether it's how you handle emotions or anger, or even how you deal with friends and people. Think of one critical major change you may need to make. And we will focus on that. I'll call the series in January, Back to the Basics. I'll be teaching you basic things that we have missed in church for so long. The meaning of salvation, the need for prayer. Why come to church? Why read the word of God and how do we read it? Back to the basics. And I'll open the first service with change. Why change is critical. And when you don't change, you perish. I'll show you why change must happen in your life or in any organization. For it to continue to exist, every organization, every individual must consistently reinvent themselves, recreate themselves, rebrand themselves. That's the whole idea. Tennister Serena Williams said, 
You have to believe in yourself when no one else does. I read a scripture many of you know. In Romans 8, 38 to 39, I'll just paraphrase this morning. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, we are unbeatable. We cannot be defeated by anything. Not height, not depth. Not the present, nor the future. Not ages, nor demons. Not life, nor death. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We cannot be defeated. Romans 8.31 If God be for us, who can be against us? That means before you can beat me, you have to come through God. You have to pass through God first. If God be for us, can COVID defeat us? Talk to me. If God be for us, can drugs defeat us? Talk to me. If God be for us, can sickness defeat us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you this beautiful morning. We receive your word. We honor you. We love you. We thank you for your word. As we pray, those of you watching me on Facebook and YouTube, I want to give you a chance to give your life to Jesus Christ, to be your Lord and Savior, and have a new beginning. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I am now saved. I am now born again. I am now your child. In Jesus' name, amen. For the rest of us, let's pray. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus, bring peace to a family that is going through serious stress, serious distress. Come through for them, O oh God. Make them to agree. May the Prince of Peace come between a husband and a wife, children and parents, siblings, to the praise of your name. Father God, in the name of Jesus, there are people watching us from hospital beds. Others are sick right in their homes. We pray in the name above all names, the Lord who heals us. You sent your word and healed our disease. May you heal them, God, from their head to their toe. You healed me, Jesus. Heal them, dear God. In the name of Jesus, name above all names. There are people who are mourning because they have been left by their loved ones. They are loving mom. They are loving dad. They are loving brother. They are loving sister. They are loving child. They are loving grandparents. Comfort them, dear God. Comfort can only be found in you. Open their eyes to see the power in your resurrection. The hope in your resurrection. Blessed be your name, O God. Blessed be your name. Restore every marriage that is going through a difficult situation. Save situations in people's lives, O oh God. Bless the entrepreneurs watching me, Father. Let them be kingdom fathers. Bless them so much that they will support your work to the glory of your name. Thank you for our students struggling to raise their school fees. Come through for them, O oh God. Let them not drop out of school. Come through for them. Because God, you own cattle in a thousand hills. You can clear the school fees balances for this student. You can clear the hospital bills for this one you healed. Come through, Father, for everyone watching us today. To the glory of your name. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We honor your name. Glory to God in the highest. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children said, amen. amen and amen. If you pray that prayer of salvation after me, you are born again. You confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
I ran classes yesterday. I was running them. They are discipleship classes for new believers. I encourage you on this Facebook live. Just write the words. I prayed to be saved. I prayed to be saved. I identify you. I will reach out to you. And enroll you in our discipleship program. Just write simple words. I prayed to be saved. I prayed to be saved. Thank you. And God bless you. Shalom.